thanks for that. <clears throat> and uh, look, we got a different format. I thought we'd just follow on in the style of conversation, which means that, you know, <clears throat> you need to talk at some point in time. And whether, you know, it's a point to add to or a point of clarification, feel free. But I want to just be fairly relaxed about this uh, and let you sort of discriminate between fact and fiction. Because as Brother Peter did sort of start off this morning's exhort, there is, we had a bit of a discussion and, and there are different views about different things in terms of uh, facts. Some things we can establish, some things we can't. But why did I start off by reading Psalm 42, do you think? What echoes are there in this psalm that relate to the Lord's last week of his life and, and particularly, of course, um, the last night of his life and the events that happened thereafter? Well, one thing's fairly clear, I think, that comes out of it is this refrain. It occurs twice in this psalm and occurs in the next Psalm 43 as well. Why art thou cast down, my soul? Why art thou disquieted? And we know that the Lord was in severe anguish particularly on that last night in the garden of gethsemane such that he sweated great as it were great drops of blood and he was in anguish of soul and we're going to see in this um, uh, two two days i think or two two studies that we've got uh, hopefully how there are a whole lot of themes that run through both the psalm and and the last week and the last night of of the lord's life at the same time we're going to well look at some chronology so i've sort of divided the study into two bits i'll do a, a bit out of each section on the two days um and that's why you got that hand at, sorry that's why you got that hand out at the moment i've got to, i want to sit back and relax can i um okay sit back and relax um yeah and uh We'll look at some sort of factual things, I suppose, like the chronology, because it's actually uh, quite interesting. Well, I found it interesting. You might not, you know, but the lights are off, so you can go to sleep back there. Uh, interesting to see about some of the facts of the chronology, and, and in fact, it plays an important part in some of the, uh, our understanding of some of the things which happened. Um, and we'll, we'll have a look at that, particularly as we see, the, the Last Supper was not just a supper. It was, it was the Passover. And there are some, like, 15 steps or 15 elements, actually, uh, that would happen on that Passover night. Whereas we, I think, seem to have the impression that it's almost you know, just one long, continuous meal, but a meal. But it's actually not like that. And then a couple of themes which run through. Um, the expression which we'd read in... And I'm basing it on mostly on John's record... The hour is come. There's, there's something about this expression about this is a particular point in time. There's the theme of anointing. Uh, you might recall that there's several anointings which actually happen in this last thing. Starts off with Mary anointing the head and feet of our Lord. Then there's the purification, the washing of the disciples' feet, as it were. And then there's the service, the whole concept of service. Now, I have to say I changed um, my original sort of scope of the study. I was going to just focus on John 17, the Lord's Prayer, prayer of all ages. Um, but when I started to get into that chapter, I, I, I found there just seemed to be almost random thoughts and structures. I, I, I couldn't sort of put it together in a structure of A to B that was really quite simple and I started to wonder where these thoughts and why these thoughts of the Lord were, were coming and where they're coming from and I realised after a while really that that prayer is a summary of a whole lot of things which happened in that last week and that prayer of course was given in the last night um, before they went to the Temple Mount, sung a hymn and, and there were other things which happened. And so I thought, well, no, I should really broaden the scope, which means I've disobeyed my wife and I have a lot more material uh, than, than I'm going to ever be able to get through. So we're just going to get to wherever we get, OK? Now, let's have a look at Jewish and Gentile times because one of the issues that arises when we try and work out 
a chronology of, of what actually happened, is there's all these references to day and night and morning and evening and the Sabbath day starting and the Sabbath day ending. And it, it just pays, and I just want to spend just a couple of minutes, not long, just understanding that there are three different time scales uh, which are referred to in the record. And for the Jewish people, it was really easy. Um, sunset to sunrise. Sunset started, sunset 6 p.m., about 6 p.m., um, through to 6 p.m. the next day. And, I mean, that started right back in Genesis, doesn't it? It was the evening and the morning were the first day, the evening and the morning were the second day, etc., etc. And that set the pattern for the Jewish day. Evening was the beginning. Evening was the morning, in actual fact, of the Jewish day, even though it was night time. Romans wasn't quite so easy. In actual fact, even the calendar, you know, we have 12 months of the year, a calendar, we just take it for granted. Well, in Roman times, but before Christ, in times of Caesar, a few earlier ones, um, there was a terrible trouble with the calendars because it was because they were a farming community, they set the calendars by when they sowed the wheat, when they reaped the wheat, when they got this crop and whatever crop, which meant that with different countries, it all started, your year started at different times. Now, Caesar wasn't too happy about that because he was, you know, wanted his empire to be under control, so he developed the 12-month calendar that we now have. A civil calendar, as it's called. It's exactly the same as what we have now. Starts at midnight and goes through to midnight. Okay? So there's a six hour difference between the start of the day for a Jew and the start of a day for a Gentile. But that's not the only thing the Romans did. They also talk about natural days. That is, sunrise to sunset. For them, that was a natural day. And what, how, do they, how do they work out where they were? Well. The first hour of the day was prima de horror. That, that's the day's going to start, horror of a day or whatever you want to, however you want to pronounce it. And the first hour of the evening, which would be 13 hours after, after sunrise, uh, was prima noctis horror. So you always had one, two, three, 12 hours, but 12 hours of the night had that other... My pronunciation okay? Yeah. yeah, I doubt it. Um... And then there was the third measurement of time, and that was the watches of the night, in which they had four divisions of three hours each. And why is that relevant? Well, you've got the third hour was the cock crowing. It's known as the cock crowing hour. And the fourth hour was the when the crow stopped. I, I would have stopped it a long time <laughs> if we're going for an hour. But anyway, that, that's, that's how they measured it. That's what they said. And dawn then came in the fifth hour, and in the sixth hour uh, was the morning, which is relevant for when we talk about the, um, of course, the crucifixion, because there are references to hours of the day, aren't there? Any comment? Any thought? No? Stunned you with facts? Okay, here's a bit of fiction. Now, no, it's not really fiction. There, there's a basis for what I've, what I've got. You've now got the... You can refer to that and we can talk about that. How does all this time fit with the Lord? Well, in summary, I am suggesting... I don't know if you can see that well enough or that's why I gave you the handout, but that's fairly small too. Um, the upshot of it all, I suppose, is that I would suggest that the Lord was crucified on the... Wednesday uh, died early in, well, in the afternoon, sometime between 3 and 4 p.m., was buried close to 6 p.m. on that day, and then rose around 6 p.m. on the Saturday. So he was three days and three nights in the tomb. Now, there are... Uh, 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 and, and a lot of debate comes probably in the area of the resurrection with where all the people went backwards and forwards. And you've got that second handout which attempts to sort of put things in a bit of order. And it looks chaotic, doesn't it? If you, if you look at that diagram there on the right-hand side, you see arrows and numbers going everywhere. Well, that's because it was chaotic. 
that's because you did have people running all over the place. You had, had the, the women come to the tomb at least three times. You had Mary and Magdalene and Mary and Martha and Joanna and a few others also come a couple of times. You had Peter and John run in and out. And then you have the way, the two of them on the way to Emmaus. But there are certain time spots that you can, what I call, anchor. You can anchor down what's actually happening. And you know what? I did leave that bit of paper behind. I nearly came out today without anything. Uh, did that, that was, you know. Anyway, how can we anchor some of these time spots? Well, we know from the record in John, if we go to John chapter 12, for example. John chapter 12, verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, and whom he raised from the dead. And there they made him a supper and Martha served. So we can lock that in. And that's the first time that you have actually on that chart. You'll see that it says um, the arrive at Bethany and they have a supper with, uh, in Lazarus, with Lazarus and there is the anointing that Mary does, uh, verse 3. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odour of the ointment. Now, one of the things which happens in the records is each of the Gospels really gives different snapshots of what happened. And they don't always have it in chronological order. And it is actually quite difficult to work out a chronology. I, I defy anyone to actually be able to say they've got it exactly right. There's arguments backwards and forwards. For example, some people argue that there were two anointings um, because one of the records talks about anointing of his head and feet, another one talks about just of his feet, and another one um, uses a different name. So, but going from, from John's record and the point of the exercise is we, can, we know where Jesus is six days before Passover. Any questions on that one? Don't think so. Um, and then the rest of the time slots have worked out much the same way and I'm really, I'm going to have to go from memory, 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 memory. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's not a good sign. But as we go to the Last Supper, we know that it was when, in actual fact, they prepared. So I think if we look at probably Matthew 24. Um, let's have a look. It's either Matthew or Mark. Yeah, the buildings of the temple. No, that's not it. Then is it? Uh, Yes, chapter 26. Chapter 26, verse 2. Oh, verse 1. And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings. So he was in and out of the temple, as Matthew records, with different sayings, giving the stories about the kingdom of heaven. And it says, You know that after two days is the feast of Passover, and the Son of Man is to be betrayed and crucified. So that locks down two things for us. It locks us down as to where he was two days beforehand and it locks down, importantly, that he was going to be betrayed and crucified at the Passover, the 14th of Abib. So there isn't too much difficulty then in saying, well, then the, the feast and the feast of Passover there was there on the 14th of Abib. So that would have started in the evening and then we have the night time of Garden of Gethsemane taken then to... Uh, in the morning to be before Pilate and then crucified. But in the crucifixion, we know some detail about the actual hours and days. Oh, there it is. Why didn't I realise that? I should have just turned the slide over, shouldn't I? Okay, so six days before Passover, John chapter 1. Two days before Passover, Matthew 26. Now, the Last Supper, the 14th of Abib, you can have a look at Luke 22. 
uh, verse 7 to 14 and Mark 14. They both say, lock that in as the 14th. So then we have the Garden of Gethsemane being that early hours, uh, late and early hours of the night. And then we have led to crucifixion. And the Mark record is really interesting uh, because he gives us detail, doesn't he? He says the third hour of the day, the sixth hour of the day, the ninth hour of the day. And if you remember back to those Roman uh, times, which I, I gave you, that would mean starting at 6am, the third hour would be 9, 6 hour would be noon, and the ninth hour would be 3pm. So we can lock that into, into the schedule. It's fairly clear. And then the women come to the grave with spices in just before the Sabbath began. So at the close of the Sabbath... They came with spices. Now, someone's going to say, aren't they? Is someone going to ask a question at that point in time? Oh, no. Did I do it? Okay. Red's not a good colour. I'm very sorry about that. Colour impaired, I believe, is the expression. <laughs> challenged. Okay. I could do a quick change if you want. Um, how's everybody else? Are we, D David? If you, this is just exactly what you've got on your page, can you not? I uh, know oh, it's not. You might need to. You want to write the quotes in, do you? Yes. It's on that one. Which one? The one with the with the map. This one. Some people will go to this one. Does anyone want that one? Most of them will be on there. Um, okay. And we can also lock in the way to Emmaus. Um, that that was on the in the in the daytime. Or on the the Sabbath day, but I I said they bought spices, you know, as the Sabbath drew on. But what day in my calendar is that? Thursday. How could that be? When's the Sabbath? What? Okay, when's the normal Sabbath? Well, Friday night yeah. to Saturday. Now I'm talking about Thursday. How come? Well, because the record actually says it was a holy convocation, like David hinted at. So it was actually a special Sabbath, a, a Sabbath that is called to celebrate the Passover, whether it fell on the natural Sabbath or whether it didn't. That day was always a Sabbath, a declared Sabbath. All right? So that, that's another thing where people get confused because they say Sabbath, oh, it must be Friday night to Saturday. But no, this is actually a holy convocation, as it's called, a separate Sabbath day. So... There are some facts, but I had a random thought. Carolyn said I had lots of random thoughts, actually. But she's really pleased that I have any thoughts. Okay, here's the random thought. I just wonder if... Now, I'd like to comment about this. In the parable of the labourers in the vineyard, he says, early morning, the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, doesn't he? And then he says the 11th hour. I, I just wonder whether there's a little hint in that parable about what's actually going on uh, with Christ in, in the cross. I, I can't think of any... Wh what other reasons w would we know for third hour, six hour? What's the relevance of pointing specifically out the hours? And I, so I just had this random thought. Where have I heard of these hours before? And, well, Matthew chapter 20... Sorry, David, it's Matthew chapter 20, verse 1, if you want to have a look to 11. Um, and it also gets a little reflection, you know, in the Lord's Prayer in John 17, because in John 17, when the Lord prays, he prays for two groups. He prays for his disciples very early on in the prayer and very extensively. And then at the end, he prays for us, those who would come after. And that occurs a couple of times and in fact it's a trigger 
for Christ thinking about his crucifixion earlier on in, uh, in as recorded earlier in, in John. In fact, we'll, we'll go and have a look at that and get some idea of the mind of the Lord. I don't know. What do you think? Worth a random thought? Okay, a little bit more fact and then we're going to go into a, a theme. The traditional Passover, just to get some appreciation of it. Now, the traditional Passover was a very structured event and at the time of, of Christ was the end of the life of Hillel. Now, you might have heard of Hillel. I don't know if you have or haven't. He's one of the famous rabbis of the Jews and a great teacher, one of their revered teachers. And he actually was the president of the Sanhedrin at that time. But he died when Christ was about 10, so there was no sort of um, you know, interaction there. But he laid out the sequence and the order of the Passover. Now, cop a look at that. Now, <laughs> I'm not going to go through or expect everyone to bang the 15 points out. But the interesting thing, for example, is there were three cups of wine, not one. There's at least three and probably four um, spreading of the bread. They all had different significances. And sort of it opened, the, the, the Passover celebration would have opened with a sanctification and a, and a cup of wine. Right? And then there's the hand washing and the, and the cleaning and, and whatever else. But what is, what is interesting is down the, at, at point five, the recitation of the Exodus story followed by hand washing with a blessing. Now, I, I think, I can't prove it, but I'm going to suggest that that is the point in time when Jesus rose up, dressed himself or, or had a towel and, and went and got a pitcher of water in a basin and washed the disciples' feet because that was the hand washing with a blessing. You see, there are other hand washings which happen, but they don't have a blessing. They're just sort of like a cleaning thing. So... After the second cup of wine is when I think Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Then there's eating unleavened bread and bitter herbs and all sorts of stuff. And the main meal is point 11. That is eating the main course, as it were. All the rest were morsels of food. But following the main meal, when you could imagine there was a lot of discussion around the table, who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven and all sorts of things like that, there was this eating of what's called the, the hidden manner and I think that's the equivalent that we have there of 1 Corinthians 11 because and the cup of wine because remember Paul says the cup after supper doesn't he now the reason why he says that is because to a Jew you know which cup you're talking about well Paul says the cup after supper also in the record there's Christ actually broke bread more than once and this helps you understand how come um, there is more than one breaking of bread. But I, I, I believe it's that hidden manner which would Christ could talk about what, what is meant by hidden manner uh, that we're talking about in Corinthians. And also with that third cup of wine, it actually would disguise, in a sense, uh, the passing of a sop to Judas because there was a cup, there was... Uh, bread, sops, whatever, being passed around. So it wasn't like everyone looked and said, oh, what are you doing, Jesus? It just would have been part of um, their celebration of the Passover. Yep. Uh, there's debate as to whether that's, uh, whether they're single or multiple. Um, it depended really on the size, more on the size of the meal. There certainly was, a, was it was poured from one source, right. but whether it was then one cup or whether there were multiple cups was, was purely a functional yeah. arrangement. So there would have been, you know, people who really had different rates and maybe, you know, but if everyone had their little, you know, first cup, now you would be very happy. Oh, yes, there's, there's quite a lot of stories that by the time you get to the third cup, um, it was a happy meal. Um, but interestingly, th th this is why there was confusion with the Corinthians. You know, it, w it wasn't as if they just suddenly turned up and started having a, a celebration and a meal and, and, and a feast because a meal was part of it. 
Um, but as Paul says, it's, it's not the important part as far as uh, remembering Christ was concerned. And then there's the songs of praise uh, that followed in a concluding prayer. And, and quite likely those songs of praise would have been, uh, many would have actually gone to the temple because the temple was shut during the Passover and then it was opened uh, when, uh, when there was considered to be for sufficient time to have actually celebrated the Passover and the temple courts were opened. The reason why that's interesting is that in John's record, Supper finishes, and then, then there's this whole four chapters of Christ talking. You know, chapter 14, 15, 16, 17. And I suggest that that probably happened in the temple courts because you have the subjects there that he spoke to. For example, the vine. Why did he suddenly start talking about the vine? Well, quite possibly in the temple courts where it was decorated with the vine, he used that as the example of... Uh, uh, you know, to draw a lesson for the disciples. Certainly there's a little bit of time between when Christ, when they finished the meal and before they got to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, okay, the other facts. Well, there might be some fiction in there. But regardless, now let's look at some themes. How does this all, you know, fit together? Well, there are some recurring themes and this is where it gets very personal the hour is come now that echoes doesn't it does, does everyone echo you, do you remember reading that several times when we read the record of Christ's life the hour the hour the hour comes all the time what we need to appreciate brethren and sisters <clears throat> experience experiencing the hour is far different knowing about the hour take your own life we take the Lord's life for example and he knew right from the beginning the prophecies we say that don't we we knew what he knew why he came he knew the suffering he was going to suffer but now it was here now, now think of your own life okay those women amongst us who have had children you know what's going to happen at the time of birth. I don't think there'd be a woman who wouldn't know. But was it like? What was it like? <laughs> Sorry, Abby. <laughs> the well, let me tell you. You know the toughest job for a husband when the wife's having the baby. That I found the toughest job was getting the right size book to read because you don't know how long the labour's going to be. <laughs> the experience is quite different to the knowledge, isn't it? Uh, isn't that true of all of us? Just in life, in life in general, we know that we've suffered trial. Is that the same as when the trial comes? Can you honestly say, oh, yeah, yep, that's fine. I know what's going to happen. Yep, yeah, I'll see this through. No drama. It's not like that. And it wasn't like that for our Lord. The experience was far different to simply the knowledge. We're going to have a bit of a look at that. Let's have a look in John chapter 12 <clears throat> and um, verse 20 to 28. Would someone like to read that? Yes, please. You got the microphone? Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethesda, Seder, of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus, but Jesus answered them, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly I say to you, 
A lesser grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies. It remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in the world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him, my father, will um, honour. Right. Now, now, my soul is troubled. And what shall I say, Father? Save life from this hour. But for this purpose, I came into this world. Our Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Right. Okay, so there's, there's the expression that the hour was come. What triggered it? A really, what seems like a really strange incident. There were some Greeks, Gentiles, and it is Gentiles. They may have converted to Judaism, but they're Gentiles. They've come to Philip and they've said, we would see Jesus. You know, you never actually hear whether if they did get to see Jesus or not. That, that doesn't come out in John's record. And John's like this. John, yeah, John's, um, he's not really worried always about the facts as such. He's worried about the themes. So these Gentiles are here. And so Philip comes and tells Andrew and both of them come and tell Jesus. And he launches off, the hour has come. So this was a trigger point in the Lord's life that Gentiles were showing the interest and the desire to see him. And what it triggered in the Lord immediately was the thought of what was coming, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. He that loves his life will lose it. And there we see the shadow, as it were, of Calvary on the Lord immediately that the Gentile thing. But the beauty of these brethren and sisters is, is his mind went to that's where we are because he used the illustration of his own death as being like corn, like being a corn of wheat. It dies, but then it brings forth much fruit. And we're part of that fruit, aren't we? What would we have had to do with Jesus if it wasn't for the fact that he died and, and yet our calling and all that sort of stuff. But here were Gentiles and it triggered straight away in his mind how would the Gentiles be included in this hope. It triggered in his mind that salvation was for the whole world. The sins of the world were going to be on his shoulders, not just the sins of the Jews, not just salvation for the Jews, but salvation for the whole world. And this incident, John says, is, is the one that triggered in his life that thought, directly as to the future but he says my soul is troubled notice that my soul is troubled why well because the experience is far different to the knowledge see that knowledge was becoming reality and it had a reaction from the Lord it had an impact on the Lord and his soul was troubled. Now let's go to Psalm 42. The reason why we read Psalm 42 is because the, of this quote, the hour had come. Because Psalm 42 is a psalm in which the psalmist is talking about the soul being troubled, but far more than just the soul being troubled, it's also got great import for, for us. Where are we? Psalm 42. All right, remember the refrain in verse 5 and verse 11. Why art thou cast down, my soul? Why art thou disquieted? Now, that's the words of the Lord. That's echoing the words of the Lord. But what happens in this psalm? It's a time of trouble for the Lord such as never was. And although he's caused to ask that question, 
although he's, he's impacted physically by what is to happen, he asks another question you know, right in the beginning. Have a look at verse 2. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? So that was the question. When shall I appear before God? Oh, my soul is destroyed. And there is this, this mix of emotion within our Lord. He knows he's going to appear before God, but, but when will I appear before God? And then his soul is, is distraught because of all the, the issues which have come upon them, that come upon him. And then we have this really strange little bit in the psalm where having been sort of distraught in verse 5, he says in verse 6, or he thinks in verse 6, Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Ah, uh, but now I'm going to remember something. Now I'm going to remember. I'll remember thee from the land of Jordan, from the Hermonites, from the hill of Mizmah, or the little hill. Well, I'm, where on earth is his mind going? Uh, here's a suggestion. His baptism, his transfiguration, and Calvary. Those are the three places where something unique happened. But, but I should clarify the Calvary bit, but can anyone think of three things which happened there? And it's actually in the John record. In that record that we read, right at the very end, something happened. What was it? God spoke. Remember? A voice thundered. Uh, people said, oh, look, it thundered. But no, God spoke. And what did he say to Christ? I have and I will glorify you. So here is the Lord in the depth of despair, really. His soul was troubled. We know he was troubled. Later in the night, at the Last Supper, he cried out in anguish, didn't he? One of you will betray me. There, were, there was a lot of anguish in the Lord at this point in time. But through all that, in three occasions, God spoke direct from heaven to his son. His baptism, in the transfiguration, and then here at this time. And what was, this, what was the overriding subject which was happening at those times? What was his baptism? What do we say baptism is? Death and resurrection. What was his transfiguration? What was Moses and Elijah talking to him about? His exodus, his death, his movement from one life to the other. And what was he talking about there in John? Except a grain of wheat die, it won't bring forth much fruit. Once again, death and resurrection. God spoke in all those three occasions, and I'm saying Calvary is represented there in, in John 12 as the seed. So on the one hand with our Lord, in, in the, God never left him. He, he, he may have been in, he was in the depths of despair. He was impacted when the hour came. But God was always there. And in this psalm, he could go back in knowledge. But in reality, three times each time, God spoke with him. But here's the beauty of it too, brethren and sisters. The focus of Jesus was not on the cost, but on the joy. Our oh, quote should have sprung straight to mind. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame, he sat down at the right hand of God. Oh, oh, what was that? Set down at the right hand of God. Well, what does that mean that he was? When shall I appear, says the psalm, before God? 
Well, Paul says he appears in heaven on our behalf, doesn't he? And for that joy that was set before him, he sat down at the right hand of God. He has appeared before God. And he knew that from this psalm. But the reality, the experience of it, was a totally different thing to, to knowledge. And, and I think we should be able to appreciate more when we think about this sort of thing, what our Lord really did for us, how he did it. And, and hopefully that's a motivation for us when trial comes. Apply the knowledge that we have. The experience can be modified by the knowledge. Did, did Christ know all the pain, the suffering and experience? Yes, he did. But his mind went beyond that. And it went beyond enough in this incident in John uh, chapter 12 that in his prayer in John chapter 17, he says, neither for these alone, but for them also which shall believe for us. So these, these weren't things just for the disciples or for their those who were there at that day. So there we have it, Psalm 42. When shall I appear before thee? Well, it was after all these things. I have to go through this, but I know what is on the other side. Now, um, the hour is come. I want you to uh, come back to John, to that record where we are John chapter um, 12 just setting that scene that's the six days before Christ uh, before Christ came uh, into well when he came to Bethany and then he went went forward from there uh, just get rid of that and go to that page Yeah, the writing is really small, isn't it? Okay. Let's go to John chapter 13. And it's still with this theme, the hour has come. Um, can someone read verse um, 1? Just, just verse 1. of the Passover when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father having loved his own who were in the world he loved them to the end mm. anyone notice a difference in that verse yeah it was right there okay this is where I got slapped on both cheeks by brother Harry Tennant who told me I didn't read my Bible carefully. He's quite right. Because it doesn't talk about the hour. What does it talk about? His hour. Right? But the Bible is amazing, you know, when we read it carefully. And you think, oh, what's the difference between the hour and his hour? Well, see, the hour is historic. The hour is knowledge. His hour is experience. So there is a difference between the knowledge and experience. There's a difference between us knowing we're going to suffer trial or persecution and experiencing it. One is the hour and one is his hour or your hour or my hour. Far different. Now, what was his thought about his hour? Well, we know the hour. The hour was he's going to be betrayed and crucified because he said that. We read that earlier in John, in John 12. So, uh, you know, he said the Son of Man's going to be betrayed. He's going to be crucified. He's a, as a grain of wheat. He's going to die. He's going to suffer. But where was his mind? Well, that he should depart out of this world under his Father. Having loved his own which were in the world... He loved them unto the end. Where's Calvary? Where's the crucifixion? You'd think that that would be on his mind, wouldn't you? Isn't his hour all about the crucifixion? No. His hour is all about his exodus 
to his father to appear at the right hand of the father for those that he love until the end. You know, can we comprehend the love, the mind, the beauty of our Lord? Who are we thinking about when we have trial? Now, I'm not minimising trial. Trial is difficult. All sorts of trials. Yeah. I know that. I guess we would usually be thinking of ourselves and us as the victim. Yeah. If, if we can just grasp a little bit of that mind of the Lord and have it in our mind, our trials are not going to be half so bad. We're going to be able to cope with them better than if we focused on the hour, the moment. So, and there we are. He loved his own. And in John 17, that's, that's that reference to the disciples and ourselves. So his hour, I'm saying, I'm suggesting to you, is, is beyond the hour. It's beyond Calvary. It is appearing in heaven. It is Psalm 42, when shall I appear? Oh, that's when I shall appear, when all this is done. And why shall I? Oh, what will I be doing? Well, I will be loving those who did all sorts of things. Didn't matter. He would love them and did love them until the end. Okay. Now here's an aside, another one of these random thoughts. Now th this one's not quite random. Where I'd like to finish our thought in this sense is here in Romans 5 verse 10. Romans 5 verse 10. Someone like to read it? For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Right. When we were enemies, we were reconciled by death. That's great. I guess it's a good thing. It is a good thing to be reconciled with God. what's the benefit of that because being reconciled isn't salvation being reconciled isn't actually salvation it's not the passage from death to life no the thing that saves the thing that is effective in saving is having been reconciled in other words having recognised that what God said in the very beginning was right and it's as simple as that we are saved by his life and that's where the Lord was he knew he knew if we go back to that point before he loves them which were his own and he loves them until the end the effect of that is the salvation isn't it so that's why we should, we appreciate the death of the Lord, but we celebrate his resurrection because tied up in that, in that life is in fact our life. And that's what the Lord was looking for and looking at when his hour came. Right, we have uh, a choice. I can end quarter of an hour early which would probably give my wife a heart attack or we can go on yeah we didn't start at two o'clock we started at quarter past didn't we okay we can have a look at one of these other bits of a theme or uh, or we can call it a day whatever you would like yeah i think go maybe for a ten, little bit ten more. minutes or so is that all right okay yep that's fine want to 
one of the themes, there's many themes which come through, you know, there's no way in the world we can deal with all the themes. But one of the themes and concepts that come through is this concept of, of anointing and what is, uh, what is characterised by that. And I've got two pictures up there, one sort of representation of Mary uh, with, at the feet of Jesus and wiping his feet with her hair. And the other one is of, of Jesus uh, with the uh, about to wash the disciples' feet. Just a, a little point of interest there. You'll notice that um, I've, there's lots of pictures, but I selected a picture in which, in fact, the Lord is holding water in a picture and he's pouring it and there would be a foot, uh, you know, the disciples' feet under there and washing them and, and then catching it in a basin. Whereas some think and some representation is like the disciples put their feet into a basin and he washes their feet and goes to the next one. Well, think about that for a minute. How would you like to be number 12? You know, yeah, all right if you're number one, but not number 12. It's a bit like watching, watch, washing the, um, the Balinese do their washing. You know, you want to be up the top of the hill uh, washing your water in the, washing your clothes in the canal rather than down the bottom of the hill. And so I think this is probably a more accurate representation. Not only that, I think a little bit more, probably that water was drawn from, you remember the disciples to find the supper went and followed a man carrying a pitcher of water? That, that pitcher would have been used for purifying. And I just suggest probably a bit of poetry there that Christ used that, um, that particular water. And remembering back to the, to the um, sequence of events with the Passover, um, that last bit of water of, of washing was the actual washing which signified purification and I think that that's when the Lord actually did this we know he didn't do it, one of the records says supper being ended but in fact um, it wasn't supper being ended because the record goes on to talk about a whole lot of other things which happened during supper, uh, that expression is a bad translation it really means supper being in progress he actually stopped at a particular point in time and got up and did this washing let's have a look at John chapter 12 and see a couple of uh, emphases and whatever that, that come through here. In John chapter 12, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. Well, that, that's a bit superfluous, isn't it? I mean, he could have just come to Bethany. Well, no, he came to Bethany and he, he, he came to Bethany where, where, where Lazarus was dead, remember? Uh, not only dead, but he raised him from the dead. So it's drawing our attention. John is drawing our attention to a place where resurrection had already been experienced by Lazarus. And he's in the house of Mary and Martha and Martha served. Well, that, that's interesting too, isn't it? Because what happened last time? What happened the first time? Well, the first time Martha complained that Mary wasn't serving. Not now. And what was it the Lord said about Mary? Leave her alone, Martha. She has chosen. She has chosen that which is the better. Now, nothing wrong with service, but Mary had chosen to be at the feet of her Lord, listening, and was commended for that. Well, she had listened. All right. Martha served. Lazarus was at the table. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odour of the ointment. Now, there's a couple of different record. A couple of the different records give different detail. Uh, one talks about anointing the head and the feet, one just talks about, the other talks about just the feet and not all of them talk about wiping his feet with his hair. Not really fussed about technical differences. There are two two things which really come out of this and that is this, this was a very personal sacrifice from Mary and it was a response to the fact that she had listened Let's go down to verse 7. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Because there was an outcry. I'm not fussed about that. But there was an outcry. And Jesus said, let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. 
The implication of those words is that she understood for a long time. She had understood somewhere earlier in the ministration of the day and the hour of his death was coming. The disciples, and you read the record, the disciples all said, no, 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 no that's not going to happen to you, Lord, or, or they had no idea, but Mary did. This was not just a, oh, this is a good idea, I'll grab this and I'll do this because he's talking about dying. No, this is something that Mary had meditated upon as long as the Lord had been saying it and she understood what was going on. Now, she took this very expensive ointment, about a year's wage. You know, people trying to work out how much it is. Forget it. Just accept that it was a year's wage. So, you know, Andrew's wage, his year's wage would be twice as much as mine. So it means something different. But it means something in the sense that if he gave it, he's given up a year, and that's expensive for him. If I gave it, it's just as expensive. It might not be the same amount, but it's just as expensive because it's a, year's, a year of my wage. That's the idea. Don't worry about the, the net value. This was probably, in fact, her dowry. I'm going to just throw that out there. It's very expensive. It was put aside for a very particular reason. And here she was, spreading it on the Lord's head and the Lord's feet because he was going to be buried. And in a sense, what's she, what's she doing? She's actually saying, well... I am the bride. I, 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 I am, you are my Lord. You are my husband. Here's my dowry. Just want you to think about it. I can't prove that. I, that's just another one of those random thoughts. Accepting this, that when Jesus goes on to talk about it, he says that, he, he says that this would be, the odour of this filled the whole, the whole of the house, the whole of the the dwelling place. Now if we take that perfume then to be sort of representative of who Mary was, what she saw and, and it filled the whole house, what, what's that talking of? Where does Jesus take this? Well, having filled the whole house, the idea in the Greek is it makes a complete family abode it's it's talking about completeness it's talking about <coughs> completeness put your hands down All right. now I want you to uh, yeah before we go there okay now come across to John chapter 14 verse 1 to 3 and you'll see how the Lord picks up what seems to be a little obscure event and then develop it develop it just remember the perfume filled the whole house and she was <coughs> saying to him you know, you are my Lord, you are my master, you, 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 I am your bride. Now the disciples' hearts are troubled, verse 1. But he says, he, he picks up the vibe that in the speeches which he's given them about persecution and going away and coming back again and, and confused the heck out of them. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, will, will believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and, and the way you know. Well, Tom, they didn't. Thomas couldn't work it out. What on earth has that got to do with Mary? Well, you see, what he's done is he's picked up the th what Mary did and he said he's applied it to all, not just the disciples, but to us, in my father's house, so he picks up the idea of the perfume filling the house. In my father's house, there's many places. It is going to be full of people. Just like Mary's perfume filled the house. And, and how? how? How is that going to be? Because I go away. Because I'm going to go through this process of death and resurrection. And then I'm going to draw you all to me. Not straight away, obviously. We're still here. But that's what he was going to do. And Mary recognised, I think, those, those, those points. 
and therefore anointed him with that perfume. That perfume filled the house. And as it said, this will be spoken of, said Christ. Christ said, this will be spoken of as a memorial for her. Just like the Last Supper is a memorial of Jesus. So this event is a memorial of Mary. So it's not insignificant. It's not just something that she did. And I think Christ pulls on that when he talks about then for everybody, everybody in the house experience that perfume. Well, we will experience that perfume in the time to come. That house will be full. And that's the promise that Jesus made. And then that flows on in John to the washing of the disciples' feet in, in John 13. In John 13, 1 16, which seems out of chronological order, but, uh, well, it is probably out of chronological order, but I'm just talking about a theme, not, not the chronology. Let's have a little, little look at this um, incident of washing the feet. So verse 4, he rises from supper. So the supper was still happening. It hadn't finished. Laid aside his, his garments and girded himself with a towel. So he took, the, he took the position of a servant. He pours water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel. And so there's echoes of what Mary did for him, but it's different for the disciples. This is the Lord doing the disciples. There's no comment from many of the disciples until he gets to Peter. I don't think Peter was first. Because it says, Then cometh he to Simon Peter. So all these disciples just sat there and watched this happen. Probably wondered, I would think, what was going on. But Peter says, do you wash my feet? Lord, you know, what are you doing? Well, we know what he was doing because when we go across to verse 15, he says quite specifically, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you so whatever he was doing here in this anointing of and washing of the disciples feet he says it's an example for you to do mm, that's a bit of a challenge now Peter dear old Peter <laughs> he worked out that this was an anointing it wasn't just purification he worked out it was anointing you know how we know that because when Christ says, if I don't wash, you have nothing. He says, wash my hands, my head, my feet. Oh, who had that done to them? Every priest in Israel. The anointing of the head, the feet, the hands. So Peter's worked out that this has got something to do with priesthood. I don't think he'd fully developed the thought. But he was a lot further along than what the other disciples were. And the Lord says, well, look, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. And so he says to Peter, well, you having been washed by me now need only the cleansing of the way of life. That's true of us, isn't it? You're baptised once and forgiven of sins, but our feet walk in all sorts of paths, don't they? And we need those feet washed quite regularly. But do you gird a towel and take a basin of water and wash each other's feet? You know, so ingrained is this. For example, the, the, the Pope does it. Now, it's a ridiculous example in that sense of uh, application, but, but the Pope will um, <clears throat> have his minions select a dozen people, supposedly at random, and there's this big ceremony that happens at one point in time and he washes their feet. It's not what Christ is talking about. How many disciples' feet did he wash? Well, it was probably more than 12. It was all the ones who were at the... It wasn't just the apostles. It was all the ones who were at the supper. But regardless of how many, Judas was one of them. And Christ knew that Judas was the betrayer because we know he calls out in anguish, doesn't he? 
So Peter understands, he reflects on it, and Jesus sets the example. What's the example? Well, I'm going to suggest this, and this is where we'll leave the, the study. The strength of our love should not be affected by someone else's weakness. It's hard, isn't it? Jesus washed Peter's feet, amongst the others, and Peter went into this exchange. Judas didn't say anything, but Jesus still washed his feet. Now that's the example. How do we live up to it? It's a bit of a sober note to end on, I suppose. But I will I will uh, call it a, a day there. Because, um, yeah, there's other themes that we'll run through and probably some a bit more um, not, not so, I don't know, sober. But I hope, anyway, in this study and next time we'll be going through different themes again, as, as I said in the beginning. Um, but... I hope by this study that you might be encouraged to just read through a little more of, of John's work. It's been a life study for me. So um, I can just talk about John till the cows come home. And we haven't got any cows, so that would be a long time. Uh, but John is very much the mind of the Lord. And so it's not easy reading. We have to think about it. But that doesn't do us any harm, does it? Thank you.